So we're going to start off the morning right off the bat with some science. So hopefully that doesn't scare you guys away too much. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about natural shoreline dynamics. So what we're going to get into... Clicker... It worked for Kathy and now it's not working for me. There we go. So, so, so we're going to start off talking about waves and lakeshore impacts and how those waves really interact with the shoreline and how those waves affect the shoreline. We're going to talk a little bit about natural shoreline benefits, but I'm not going to get into that too much because uh, Julia Kirkwood from, from Eagle will be talking about that in a little bit more detail a little bit later. And then uh, just to keep it a little bit fun and light, we're going to talk about some shoreline plants too because everybody starts thinking about plants this time. Next slide. So when we start talking about natural shorelines, one of the things that we like to focus on is what we call the land-water interface. And that's this area where the lake shore interacts with the lake itself. Uh, this is an incredibly uh, critical habitat niche. All of our amphibians, fish, mammals, insects, they really rely on this very narrow band along the lake shore to be able to cross back and forth across the water. Or, or back and forth from the water to the land. Now, what's uh, especially important to consider about this is that this is typically not only one of our narrowest habitat niches along the lakeshore, but it's also very susceptible to erosive forces. So these are places where not only waves interact with boats, people, fishermen, swimmers, as well as all of that wildlife. So, so from an overall aerial perspective, even though these areas are very small, they're incredibly critical and they're also incredibly fragile. Next slide. So one of the main ways that uh, these areas can be impacted is by waves. So waves can interact with and impact our shorelines in a handful of different ways. One of the first and most obvious ones is soil erosion. Uh, the waves will actually take carry away that sediment, uh, causing a loss of land and, and actually contributing to sedimentation within the lake itself. In addition to that, waves will actually phys or can actually physically displace plants. So we might have plants established along the lake shore. Well, the waves can actually take those plants and actually move them and dislodge them. Uh, one of the things that people don't of often consider is turbidity. Uh, that act of soil erosion and waves can, can continually stir up sediment, especially when you have silts and clays and fine sediments uh, along the lake shore. And what happens is when you get in these situations where you get a lot of turbidity, it will actually limit the ability of plants to grow within the lake shore itself. And ultimately, that winds up taking away habitat for fish and amphibians and everything else that likes to use the lake shore. So waves wind up being this incredibly important function. And when we look at waves, they are a function of fetch, de water depth, slope, wind speed, and wind duration. Can we move on to the next? So we're gonna talk about waves a little bit and how waves really work. So waves are not a transfer of, of water. Waves are actually a transfer of energy. So, so some of you may see this, uh, uh, so you might see this if you're ever at the beach. And if you're sitting out, in, and if you're sit, sitting out off the lake shore on a raft, waves come back and forth. And you don't necessarily automatically get carried into the lake shore, but you kind of bob up and down because these waves are transferring energy uh, uh, from the lake over to the lake shore itself. So as, wa as waves move, they have this circular orbit. Uh, and then as waves get closer to the shoreline themselves, uh, when, when, wa when a wave height reaches approximately 80% of the water depth, that wave starts to feel the friction of the lake bed. It slows the wave down and it causes that wave to start to rise up and break. And where that wake rises up and breaks and starts to crest is critical because that orbital force of that wave hitting the lake shore is typically what really causes that erosion. So I'm gonna watch this video a little bit. So so a wave will start to break offshore and what happens is when we have a gentle slope, the waves will break offshore and then you kind of get this gentle swash and back swash across the shoreline itself. So a lot of that energy is dissipated when we have a gentle slope. Move on to the next slide. 
So here's a concept demonstrated again with our little surfer dude here. So if you look at a gentle slope, that wave is gonna to start to break offshore, the energy is dissipated, and then that energy along the lake shore just kind of sloshes a little bit. When you get a more moderate slope, that wave is going to start to break until later, later closer to the shore, it's gonna break larger, and it's gonna crest and break onto the shoreline itself. And then when we get lake shores with steeper slopes, that, that wave's not gonna break until it gets very close to the shoreline, and then you're gonna get all of that energy transfer right up onto the shoreline itself. So what we wind up learning from this is that that slope is really critical. And what happens is most of our natural shorelines, our natural Great Lakes shorelines, Muskegon Lake shorelines, historically would have been very gentle, what we would call a 10 on one to 20 on one slope. So that's where a lot of these natural shorelines were very resilient to water level fluctuations and waves over time because that energy is being dissipated. But what happens is oftentimes when we build up the, the shoreline, we start to use our shorelines. In the case of Muskegon Lake, like Kathy said, we have a lot of unnatural fill along the shoreline. Those wind up being very steep angles because we're trying to have as much usable land as we can. And when we do that, we create these steep slopes along the shoreline, which takes away the ability for that sh of that shoreline to naturally break those waves. Go next slide. So here's an example of that, uh, kind of in real time. So the, the top left picture, uh, that was uh, that was taken from an MLive article back in late 2016. There was a storm on Muskegon Lake. Uh, that's the east side of the lake over off of Edgewater Drive. The bottom right picture is Lake Michigan. Uh, both of these settings had very similar conditions. Sustained 40 to 60 mile an hour winds over a period of time on Muskegon Lake where we have a deep area and we have seawalls and built up land right next to it, those waves did not break until right when they got up to that seawall. And, and in this case, we had six to eight foot waves that weren't breaking until they hit the shoreline itself. And in this case, these waves are actually throwing aquatic vegetation on rooftops across the street. On this day on, Mus on Muskegon Lake, this is Grand Haven State Park, I actually went down and, and took this picture. We had 20 foot waves out off the shore. So big waves uh, like, Mich Lake, like Lake Michigan will kick up every once in a while during the year. But what happens is in this case, those waves are breaking out off the shoreline. So by the time those waves are getting up to that actual land water interface, they've broken and we're just getting this much more gentle swash and backswash across the shoreline itself. So that really goes to demonstrate what this shoreline slope really does and how important it is. Next slide. So one question that comes up a lot these days is how do water levels impact what's actually going on? So I took this video actually on Muskegon Lake last September. And as everybody knows, this isn't new to, to anybody right now. Lake Michigan has been flirting with and is hanging around these sustained all-time highs. And along with that, Muskegon Lake is, uh, is up around that same thing. So what happens is as water levels rise, not only do we get increased flooding, but those waves wind up coming closer to the shore and coming closer to that built environment. And as that, hap as that happens, because these waves are transfer of energy, and they're getting away from the shallower slope with these higher water levels. These waves aren't breaking offshore. They're not. They're waiting to break until they get up to the shoreline itself. In this case, it's a rock shoreline. In other cases, it might be a seawall or some kind of hardened structure. So that energy doesn't get dissipated until you get right up onto the shoreline itself. So we wind up with bigger waves bigger waves closer to our infrastructure. And at the same time, those waves aren't breaking offshore, they're breaking when they hit that actual hardened shoreline itself. And that's obviously causing a lot of trouble all the way around the Great Lakes Basin as infrastructures uh, uh, in threat of being damaged uh, all the way around the lake. We'll go to the next slide. 
So we take this, we take this understanding of how waves work and how waves interact with shorelines and we say, so where have we been? What have we done? And what can we learn from some of these lessons? So we start to look back at historically what we've done along with these shorelines. And we have things like, oh, the clicker's working out, cool. Uh, you know, concrete, asphalt, junk, just junk along the shorelines. Concrete seawall, or steel seawalls. This is a 25 foot seawall that was put in along uh, Lake St. Clair. Uh, when you're talking about that land water interface, if you're a turtle or a frog and you're trying to go back and forth from the land to the water, well, that's not really an option. We've got a 25 foot seawall uh, in your way. Go next slide. Same type of thing concrete hardened structures along the shoreline itself. Next slide. More of these seawalls. And something to, to keep in mind when we're talking about these steep seawalls, when you talk about all of this energy, is that when you have a wave and that's not breaking until it gets right up to that seawall, all of that energy is going to be transferred right onto that vertical face. So there's no opportunity for that energy to ever be dissipated. And what we find is that during storms, even those co concrete and steel seawalls wind up uh, eventually degrading and falling apart over time. Next slide. So what? So this is a graphic that the Shoreline Partnership and Tip of the Mitt Watershed Partnership uh, put together that kind of demonstrates this concept. When these waves come along, none of that energy ever gets dissipated. So that wave energy just turns and it scours off of that seawall. And what happens when you have that scour is all of that sediment at the base of that seawall gets disturbed and eroded. So you start to lose your vegetation and that sediment gets scoured. And then as that sediment gets scoured, your water depth along that seawall actually becomes deeper. And the deeper that water is, like we just saw with the waves, then the bigger those waves are gonna be and the more likely those waves are gonna be to actually uh, uh, have higher energy and impact that seawall itself. Next slide. Same type of uh, concept.